It will look into why prosecutors accepted a plea of manslaughter from Valdo Calocani. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 33 points at 76.66. The pound buys $1.26 and a euro 16. LBC weather dry for much of the UK tonight, turning windy in the north with some rain in the far northwest with lows of minus two. Rain moving into the north tomorrow, starting bright in the south but turning cloudy later on with a high of 11. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC. From Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. Welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question with me, Ian Dale. On the show tonight, we have with us Ian Dunt, columnist for the uh, I newspaper and author. He's also, well, he's author of the book How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't. Anita Boateng is a political commentator and former advisor to the conser- to various Conservative cabinet ministers. She's now a partner of the PR agency Portland Communications. Annalise Dodds is uh, Labour's party chair and shadow women and equality secretary and MP for Oxford East. And Sir John Hayes is Conservative MP for South Holland and the Deepings. He chairs the Common Sense Group of Tory MPs. If you're watching on Global Player, you may realise that John Hayes hasn't quite arrived yet, but we're assured he is on his way. And the way to ask a question to the panel, as you know, is call 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 or say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Right, let's kick off with Stephen in East Grinstead. Hi, Stephen. Hi, good evening to you and your guests. Should the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, now be required to attend the House of Commons to answer MPs' questions? regarding his role as Foreign Secretary and the decision he's making as a member of the government. I think at the moment the only person he's accountable to is the Prime Minister who uh, parachuted him into his position. Well, he, he, he does give evidence to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and answers questions in the House of Lords. We should clarify that. But Ian Dunn, is this a classic way of how Westminster doesn't work? No, actually, I'm perfectly fine with this. Two of the best parts of Westminster, I mean, hardly any, any of it works at all, but the Select Committees are good, and the House of Lords is very good. The House of Lords has expertise, has independent-minded people in it, does a far more effective job of scrutinising legislation than the Commons does. So if I'm going to worry about how the Foreign Secretary is scrutinised, I would be pretty happy thinking that he can sit there in front of the Select Committee and the House of Lords. You can put him in the Commons if you want, and you'll get the usual argy-bargy, shouty-shouty, and you'll, you'll learn out almost absolutely nothing by the end of it. Because I think there is a suggestion that he should address the House from the bar of the House, so he wouldn't actually have yeah. a dispatch box or anything. He'd just, like, stand there, which, I mean, I suppose you could do that, but it would seem a bit odd. Also, it would be weird to do it now. I mean, do you remember, like, in the middle... Well, you probably don't remember this personally, but in the middle of World War II, we had this exact <laughs> thank same you, thank problem you. with Halifax. <laughs> thank I mean, you. I'm just guessing here. Um, we had the same problem with Halifax. Halifax would have arguably become Prime Minister instead of Churchill if it wasn't for the fact that he would have had to appear in the Lords rather than the Commons. If we didn't do it in that scenario, and I'm kind of glad that we didn't in that scenario, we're probably not going to find ourselves in such an extreme position that we would do it here. I'm not sure he'd welcome the comparison to Lord Halifax, would he? <laughs> <laughs> A piece of extraordinaire. <laughs> Annalise Dodds. Good evening. I mean, I do think it's quite extraordinary the Prime Minister couldn't find a suitable candidate for Foreign Secretary for amongst his MPs, but ultimately that question of how a member of the House of Lords is actually made accountable is a really important question. I think it's quite right that it's been raised. I mean, Labour did push to make sure that we had those arrangements with a select committee, with the House of Lords as well. But it is really important we have that accountability, I have to say. I'm, I'm not as down on the House of Commons, perhaps, as Ian is. I think it is important, actually, that we're able to ask questions on behalf of our constituents. And so we do need to make sure that accountability just, is present. Just remind me how, when Lord Mandelson was brought back by Gordon Brown, how he was accountable. Because he was first, sec- he was basically Deputy Prime Minister at the end of the Gordon Brown government. But I, I don't remember many calls from Conservatives for him to come to the House of Commons to answer questions. I have to say, though, we are talking about the person who's meant to be the face 
of our country internationally. I think that is a critically important role. And just as the caller said, this is a really important time internationally. You know, it's a critically important time for our country to be putting its best foot forward, to be trying to play our part in, you know, some really, really difficult situations, to be exercising that diplomatic muscle where we have it. And so it is important, I think, that there is appropriate accountability. And as I said, you know, we did push for select committee uh, engagement around that and also for the House of Lords to make sure that they were exercising their role too. Anita? Um, I think that ultimately David Cameron isn't just, is not just a question of the fact that Rishi Sunak couldn't find others. David Cameron is a consummate politician with amazing networks across the international um, sphere and this is a really critical time as Annalisa says and as a result of that I think it's really important that we leverage everyone with soft power and credibility on the global stage to drive the UK's interests abroad and we've kind of seen from what David Cameron has said today about Palestine and really leaning into into the international efforts to try to drive towards a solution, that he is effectively being able to corral some of those big figures around the world to ensure the UK still has a voice. So I personally, in terms of the House of Lords, I think Ian is right. Um, I recall a peer saying that really he's slightly terrified sometimes to stand up in the House of Lords because someone will stand up and say, well, yes, I wrote that piece of legislation mm. that you are, you know, discussing. In 1934. And, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think there is a wealth of knowledge and expertise and experience there and we should be capitalizing on it on it more and i think that we do have a mechanism whereby statements for instance are repeated in the commons and um certainly the ministers there have to be able to convey the political point of view and by all accounts from some of the interventions that have happened recently we have definitely seen um cameron briefing and the opposition being on un- understanding things like the action against the houthis so i think all the stuff that needs to happen is happening alongside pretty tough scrutiny from select committees and and from fellow peers. Um, Anita's point about him have already have, having an existing network across the world, I think we've seen quite a lot of evidence of mm. that, haven't we? And isn't he saying things to the Israeli government that, frankly, his immediate predecessors might not have been able to do because they didn't have his stature? I suppose my response to that would be to say we have actually had 14 years of Conservative government. Obviously, David Cameron clearly played a huge part, as indeed did Anita back at the beginning of that time. But we've had many other Conservative governments since. And frankly, if we have to rewind right back until then in order to have those networks reactivated, I would ask what we've been doing in that gap in time. And actually, sorry to jump in, but I think many would say that our international standing sadly has actually been reduced during some of that time because there's not been that consistent engagement coming from the UK. Well, let, let me put it another way. Would you rather have David Cameron... Boris Johnson, Liz Truss or James Cleverly as Foreign Secretary? Well, I'd obviously rather have David Lammy than any of them. You'd expect me to say that. I think really we need to well, have someone... Which of someone... those four do you think is, is the best? I'd, I'm, I'm really sorry to say I think it's... It, 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 you're asking the wrong person. This is a Hobson's choice. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, with all respect to each one of those individuals... I'm sure the three of us could answer that question. <laughs> so I don't see why you should be let off the hook. Well, because I genuinely think, actually, that we have had that long period where, as I said, we haven't been putting our best foot forward. I I find that all the time. Unforgivably. (laughs) Yes. I I find that all the time when I, you know, talk with people from other countries, meeting with some of our sister parties, Labour Party sister parties earlier this week, and people from international business, you know, they'll say, well, you know, Britain used to be the country that was at the front of the pack. You know, you think about, for example, Davos, my understanding is that actually the Conservative government turned up kind of in the middle of the night once most people had gone home. We had a similar approach to the COP conference as well. We should be really pushing for our country's interests in these fora, but it feels like we've just been absent for many of the previous years. Well, I, I think they just thought, well, Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer are there, so they, they can represent Britain, get a bit of practice mm-hmm. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously it was, it was a positive thing for Labour to be having those conversations, but I think it does reveal a lack of application from the existing government that's meant to that be governing That is a fair country. point, though, Anita, isn't it? I mean, surely 
I mean, maybe maybe not Rishi Sunak, but I think Gordon Brown would have attended all of those. I think David Cameron attended all of them. Why, why wasn't Rishi Sunak there? I mean, Jeremy Hunt was there, um, who is obviously the Chancellor. I also think that we, look, we, we owe ourselves, our listeners and everyone, a duty to be perfectly honest about the ways in which Labour would have attacked Rishi Sunak for going and been like, well, he's obviously rich and out of touch, so isn't he there with Davos being rich and out of touch? So Lining I, up his next I, job, that's I, what you I just said, think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, not at all, because and, Labour and was that, present there because we think it's important that we actually are having those conversations with business for the good of our country. So we're not we're not hypocritical about this. We think it's important that Britain has a strong voice in these fora, and that's why you had Labour representatives there. And you had because we Jeremy want Hunt, to be arguing the for Chancellor it. there. He eventually think, came after all the you? stuff to do with Rwanda, as I understand it. Well, it played through the system, and that just indicates that this chaos that we've seen for a number of years now really is hitting our ability to have our interests argued for on the world stage. Britain deserves better than that. Annalisa, I'm going to very gently suggest that, of course, Starmer and Reeves have very busy jobs, but the Prime Minister has a number of quite serious demands on his time. And I think the Chancellor going to Davos and having a series of, my understanding is, pretty good and meaty meetings does cover off that issue around international engagement. And what we have seen from, from Rishi Sunak in terms of his ability and willingness to lean into things like, for instance, the Windsor Framework. There have been countless moments where Rishi Sunak has really taken the world stage. And I also think he's very nicely complimented by David Cameron, Lord Cameron, who has considerable stature on the world stage and is definitely seeing the UK's interest driven forward. I really don't think you can look across the spectrum of what Sunak has done to his Prime Minister and say he's not interested in international affairs. The AI Summit, we will look back possibly at the AI summit as a first moment for the international community coming together and the precedent that set possibly decades into the future and I'm not exaggerating about that a forum for the Chinese in the West for instance to come together could actually stand the test of time and really shape something as seismic as AI but, but for Ian, instance. Ian that is an interesting suggestion from Anita there that Rishi Sunak is really interested in foreign affairs because the narrative seems to be and even among some conservative MPs is that he has no interest in defence and no interest in foreign affairs now, mm. I don't see how you can be Prime Minister if you don't. What, what's your analysis? I think quite a few Prime Ministers have no interest in foreign affairs. And mm. mostly not concerned. the second <clears throat> terms, anyway. Well, mostly concerned with what's going on on this island. I mean, he doesn't seem particularly fascinated by it. The, the thing is, though, to be fair to him... He has been under attack pretty much from the moment that he walked into number 10, right? You're at the end of 14 years of a government. He's not a particularly competent individual. He's not a particularly competent politician. His parliamentary party is almost completely insane. And you have to spend an awful lot of time just trying, as you can see with Rwanda, really, just desperately trying to keep these warring factions from tearing each other to shreds or tearing you to shreds. I mean, you know, most of last week we were talking about how many letters of resignation are going to go in. This is just the sort of tawdry end of cycle that you get in the fag end of a government. And if you're in that situation, you don't have a lot of time to go to Davos. You're mostly going to be like, I need to be in Parliament making sure that my guys are not misbehaving. And I think probably rather sensibly, that's how he's choosing to spend his time. We'll have more of your questions in just a minute. 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC.
17 minutes past eight on LBC. Uh, Annelise Dodds is with us, Labour's party chair, MP for Oxford East. Uh, Anita Boateng is a political consultant and commentator. And Ian Dunt is a columnist for the I newspaper and an author. I'm, I'm told that Sir John Hayes is moments away... <laughs> Boy, is he going to get his behind kicked when he gets here. <laughs> uh, let's go to Robbie in Chelmsford. Hello, Robbie. Evening, all. And at the risk of banging on about Lord Cameron of chipping Norton, in a related <laughs> matter, his comments today, as well as the UK government's stated position to support a two-state solution in the Middle East, Israel and Palestine, surely it makes absolute sense that we recognise a state of Palestine and statehood for the Palestinians as a crucial part, paving of the pathway to peace. I, I thought it was interesting that Cameron's comments today saying that sort of the government is sort of edging in that direction or words to that effect. And we're going to talk about this much more after nine o'clock and get uh, everyone's views on that then. But Annelies Dodds, what, what, what do you think about this? Is this a change of attitude by the British government? I mean, I think it's unclear on the British government side whether it is a change of attitude or <laughs> merely coming out of the particular way in which Lord Cameron expressed himself. I mean, certainly Labour's position on this has been very consistent. You know, we believe uh, that ultimately, I mean, clearly we're in a dreadful, dreadful situation currently in Gaza. We, we've called for, obviously, humanitarian truce that can then provide that space to achieve a sustainable ceasefire, obviously, to get the hostages freed, to get the much-needed aid in to Gaza. But then we really do need to see a two-state solution and ultimately that phrase has been bandied around by politicians often as a slogan, to be honest. We've not really been working towards it as hard as we should have been. There must be that diplomatic process. You know, we must achieve peace. And as Robbie said, that needs to be with a sovereign Palestine as well as a sovereign Israel so that we can actually have security finally and what is ultimately the, the right of both Palestinians and of uh, Israelis as well. But surely, um, given there isn't a Palestinian state, um, recognising one is just the equivalent of virtue signalling. Well, what we need is, is what I've just set out. I mean, we need to deal with the immediate humanitarian catastrophe oh, sure, that but what is the Gaza. point of recognising a Palestinian state when it doesn't exist? Well, we, we believe, and obviously we've talked about this quite a bit, both Keir Starmer and David Lammy have set this out at length. We believe that there has to be a peace process. And we as a country actually have a lot to give in this area because we clearly, and so many differences, I'm not suggesting they're the same situation at all, but we have had experience of peace building in our country. We need to be applying that ultimately that experience and that determination right now. It's needed now more than ever. And I appreciate that to many people, the idea of a two-state solution now can seem extremely far away. Of course it can. When we've got such appalling uh, scenes um, being beamed to us all the time from Gaza uh, and previously from Israel as well. But we need to keep that light alive. You know, Keir Starmer has talked about keeping that light alive. We have to do that. OK. Uh, so John Hayes has joined us. Welcome. Um, now, the question here, and I'll tell you what the question is, but go to the other two panellists so you can have a moment to catch your breath and, and think about it. Um, it's from Robbie in Chelmsford. He says, if we want a two-state solution, surely we should acknowledge the existence and viability of a Palestinian state. Uh, Ian. Yeah, I mean, it's quite nice to hear anyone talking about this seriously. And, and I say this is someone doesn't like David Cameron, thought he was a dreadful Prime Minister. I think it's really impressive, the manner in which he spoke about it today, the, the strength of the language that he used and the fact that he's showing direction on it. So we're trapped. We're trapped in this extraordinary situation. I mean, you hear the things that come from the Israeli government at the moment. You just think, like, this is just the most unbelievably despicable approach, which is it's essentially exactly the same as you would hear on on Palestine marches, saying, you know, from the river to the sea. That is basically the rhetoric you're getting from Netanyahu. When you talk to predominantly left-wingers supporting Palestine, you get almost no recognition at all of why Jewish people might feel that they need a state, that they need somewhere to be safe, why they not, might not be safe in somewhere that was a one-state solution, why actually there's a moral obligation, a historic one and a present one, to make sure that Jewish people are safe. When the debate is that toxic, 
on both sides. To actually see a British Foreign Secretary come out and speak quite clearly on this subject was very, very welcome indeed. He did very good work today. Anita? Yeah, I agree with that. And one thing that he said really struck me, which he said the last 30 years have been a failure. And I, I don't think mm. he's wrong about that. And the one thing I would say um, in terms of the approach that the government has taken, from my perspective, it feels as though the government has rightly tried to, alongside the US, take Israel on somewhat of a journey, which is to say, we're not going to start off by saying, but gosh, what about this, this two-state solution when you've just had this horrific attack happen? We're going to recognize the insecurity that you feel, and we're going to recognize the horrors that have been meted on um, the, the hostages, but, but take them along that journey towards, um, so what is an outcome? What is the route to victory? Because clearly we cannot, um, well, they're going to struggle to completely eradicate Hamas. They're going to struggle to find a way to govern Gaza in such a way, well, anyone to govern Gaza in such a way that it's safe. And I think that, that David Cameron has carefully chosen, I think, the moment to lean in and say, we need the international community, Europe, the US and the countries in the region to work together and recognise that what we've done in the past just hasn't worked. And that we need to find a new way to build some kind of security and safety and also obviously manage the, the terrorist threat that inevitably still exists. So I thought that it was somewhat of a risk um, from David Cameron's perspective because the UK has, I think, rightly taken the approach of taking Israel, and by that I don't just mean Netanyahu, right? Israel's a big place with lots of different points of view, but a journey that needs to be taken on, on all sides towards some kind of solution, recognising that I think, you know, October the 8th was not the day to have that conversation. Now feels like more of the time to have that conversation. John Hayes. I think two things. First of all, I don't entirely agree with David Cameron. I work for David Cameron in Downing Street, as you know, Ian, and he, uh, we don't agree about everything. We didn't agree about anything then, by the way. Uh, but he certainly added immense weight to the government, partly because of his experience. He's an immensely experienced politician. He's been a world leader, and partly because of his seriousness. You know, he's, he takes these matters seriously and speaks seriously. So I think he's been a, uh, a breath of fresh air, really. Uh, in terms of his, his role in the Foreign Office. The second thing I'd say is that I think most of the pundits are right um, to say that Britain has a key role to play here. Um, so America, of course, is, the, is a, a huge voice, but we shouldn't underestimate Britain's influence. I'm in the unique position, perhaps, I think, a unique but unusual position of having very close Arab friends and close Jewish friends. And I'm proud to say that, actually. And what they tell me um, is that Britain underestimates uh, its role because of its uh, history, its reputation, and the esteem which is held by a lot of people. And so we shouldn't underestimate the role we can play in getting a, a best outcome here. So I'm speaking uh, as someone who recognises all that David Cameron is, uh, as I say, sometimes I agree with him, sometimes I don't. And I think he stepped up to that role in an exemplary fashion. But do you think he's right in when he says that maybe Britain should look at recognising a Palestinian state? Well, I think, I think the two-state solution has been uh, the government's position for a long while, uh, and making that real is what that's about. Um, now, that's not without difficulties on both sides. There will be people on, on, on both sides of the argument who don't buy that argument. Uh, but the fact that, that the British Foreign Secretary has said it so emphatically is a very important uh, element in that discussion. And, and what do you think the reaction of the Israeli Prime Minister will be to this? Because I think he and Cameron have a little bit of history, don't they? I don't know if you, if you came across that during your time when you were in number 10 with him. But um, Cameron has never been an unalloyed fan of Netanyahu, it has to be said. Well, um, I don't Quite remember right. that of relationship uh, when I was in number 10, since you ask. And you'll have to ask the Israeli Prime Minister, I'm sure you could get him on, actually, and as what his reaction is. Um, but, but what I'd certainly say is there are strident voices on both sides of this debate, and what we need is measured voices. Are, are any of you optimistic that in the next 10 years there will have been any movement in this at all? I mean, we don't know how this is all this conflict, current conflict, is going to end. But it's quite difficult to see a path to a two-state solution, isn't no, it? No, I'm not optimistic at all. But the thing is, no one can explain to me what the alternative is. Yeah. What is it? 
What is the one state solution alternative? Well, or anything I, else? I think it's the one and a half state solution is <laughs> what a lot of people in the Israeli government seem to be promoting that, well, yes, if the Palestinians have a state, it'll only be half a state because they won't allow to be able to do this, that or the other. And, and even that would be a generous appraisal when you think about really the reduction in the size of Palestine from the point of the formation of the state of Israel. You know, at the point where Israel was formed, you could imagine a viable Palestinian state. From really the late 60s onwards, that became much, much harder to see on a, just a basic geographical sort of calculation. So, no, it is not easy. It does not look likely. It doesn't look probable. But if no one can explain to us what the other solution is, apart from what? The forced migration of people? like, you know, moral actions that are beyond our comprehension, if that is the only other alternative, then we have no option but to commit to that pathway. I feel more optimistic only because I think that before the 6th of October, and obviously we can talk about why we ended up where we ended up and why Hamas did what they did, and it's not clear to me they really had an end game with that anyway. We did see movement from other countries in the region, for instance, Saudi, and there is as much as there is so much, um, well, uh, so much history here, there is also a, a series of fairly pragmatic states in the region that want to move towards stability, growth and prosperity. Now, I'm not saying that is easy and I'm not saying there are not decades of enmities in between all the, all the states there. And I'm not saying, for instance, the Houthis and Hezbollah and other others do not have a specific interest in maintaining instability in the region. But I do think that there are signs that some people are tired. And I think that's the moment at which things start to change. And if we're talking about 10 years, yes, I think there is hope for a breakthrough. I mean, I think it's also really important that we are absolutely clear that we will not accept those who are making the prospects for that outcome far harder to achieve. So where we've seen, for example, the expansion of illegal settlements in the West Bank, the persecution of Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, when we've seen that getting worse during this period and kind of extremist statements from some Israeli government ministers, I think it's really important that the UK is absolutely clear that um, we completely reject that. And, you know, we were pleased when the Conservative government did accept some of what we were calling for there, because now should be a time when attempts to actively undermine progress here are very, very strongly rejected. OK, we'll move on to a different subject in just a few moments' time. Uh, 0345 6060973, if you'd like to ask our panel a question. You're listening to LBC at half past eight. Uh, here is Charlotte Morgan with the news headlines. The EU is backing changes in the movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, allowing the DUP to go back into power sharing at Stormont. It's part of a relaxation of post-Brexit trade arrangements. Detectives say they've recovered several weapons from a house after a man was shot dead by officers in south-east London. We're told he was wearing body armour when he was trying to force his way into a building in Southwark early this morning. And the Foreign Secretary is facing backlash from some Conservative MPs after suggesting the UK could look at recognising a Palestinian state. Some Tories say it would reward Hamas atrocities. LBC weather, some rain in the far northwest overnight, mostly dry elsewhere, turning windy in the north with a low of minus two. This is LBC.
disturbing. 8.33 on LBC. Annalise Dodds, Sir John Hayes, Anita Boateng and Ian Dunt with us. Um, any books coming out? Your last book was a great success, I think. Thank you, yeah. Well, the paperback comes out in March. So you can read with a slightly greater degree of comfort the various constitutional disasters that have befallen our nation. You mean you've taken all the typos out of this edition? <laughs> uh, no, I'll have you know <laughs> that a very talented copy editor did that for me on the first edition. <laughs> right, let's go to our next question. It's a text question from Michael in Kingston. First we hear of the five families and now the evil plotters WhatsApp group. Will the Tories ever stop fighting each other long enough to fight an election, John Hayes? Well, all political parties are we're told coalitions, aren't they? A mix of people with all kinds of sentiments and views and opinions, and rightly so. That in our system of government, and our parliamentary system in particular, because of the electoral system, we don't have a multiplicity of small parties in parliament. So consequently, the parties that are in parliament tend to be a mix of people with different ideas. Always, it was always so, by the way. Forever, it was ever thus. And that can be a positive thing. Because it stimulates ideas, it allows debate, it allows exchange of uh, of, uh, of sentiment. Um, but of course, it can be destructive too, and that's the implication of the question. So, in the end, uh, political parties have to pull together, and uh, I think we will before the election to fight that election. And I hope do well in that. Now, you, you had the Common Sense Group. I do. You used to lead the Cornerstone Group. Does that still exist? Um, it meets just a party conference, right. just for one event. Uh, we had Michael Nazarelli, former Bishop of Rossich, the now Roman Catholic, speak at the last party conference. We usually have one small meeting. But the, the Common Sense Group has is, is, uh, been a great success. You know, I have lots and lots of members, lots of the new intake, some ministers are in it, uh, all kinds of other people. But, I mean, who disagrees with Common Sense? Well, certainly I don't. I was, in fact, I, I personified. I mean, I can remember I William Hague. Do you remember William Hague's yeah. The Common Sense <laughs> Revolution? <laughs> well, that's, that's why that didn't name, go too well, did it? Well, that's why names matter, you know. So um, it's true that um, uh, choo the name you choose for a group has a big impact on what you do and how you perceive. But the key thing is that that group uh, is affirming a kind of authentic conservatism. I just want the Conservative Party to be more conservative. It's as simple as that, really. Annalise, you have similar groups in the Labour Party, but they don't seem to get the coverage that the Tory ones do. Well, I think that's probably because they're not ripping our party apart very publicly and sucking out all of our energy. And I think the concern yeah. is... Well, not genuinely. I think the really big issue is that, you know, the mention was just made there to the fact that, oh, maybe all these different factions might pull together before a general election... Well, how much else that's needed for our country is going to be put on the back burner until that time comes to pass? I mean, we know that we've got a Prime Minister at the moment who completely rejected previously one of the policies he now says is a flagship policy, i.e. the Rwanda scheme. He rejected that. He's now adopted it, it seems actually for purposes of party management. I mean, this is astonishing. It's a psychodrama within the Conservative Party that is having real-world consequences for people who don't see action on the cost of living crisis, that don't see action on the NHS. Now, I've got 7.8 million long NHS waiting list. They don't see action on crime. So many other areas, again, where we see announcements one day, forgotten about the next, because you have such a merry-go-round of ministers as well. So th this is bigger than just political tittle-tattle. It's having a real-world impact. And frankly, that's why if we have a party that wants to be arguing amongst itself rather than governing, perhaps it should get out of the way and have a general election and make way for a party that does want to try and give our country its future back. Bear in mind, this, this is the party of momentum. This is the party that had a party within a party. But that is why we have a leader in Keir Starmer who is determined to change his party and has changed his party. He was happy to be part we, of it though, wasn't he? We, but he ensured that where there have been issues, they've been gripped onto and dealt with. We've not seen that with Rishi Sunak. We've seen him put up time and time again with ministers who under any previous jurisdiction, I'm sure, would not have stayed in their jobs. He's done that for reasons of party management. Again, Liz trusts his honours. Reasons of party management. He's focused on those internal party issues rather than on governing for our party, our country. Ian Dunn. 
And I just think it must be really weird if you're Labour to watch the Tories do this, because I sort of think this is Labour's job. Labour is basically always at war with itself and has been since the beginning. Always, always, always. It's always been, you know, the radical left of Labour fighting the centre and on it goes and it goes from Michael Foote and you can find your way over to Tony Blair and then it goes to Jeremy Corbyn and then it goes to Starmer and this is the cyclical Labour war that will never ever end. However, what's amazing is there are certain points where Labour's like, well, hang on a minute, I think we're about to get into power now, which they are. And in that situation, Labour is suddenly like, no, hang on a minute, I think we, we can learn to get on. And the Conservative Party is now behaving in that way. So you just see this ferocious war over what? Like over nothing, really. Like like to get yourself in a war over Rwanda. The Rwanda policy doesn't even really exist. Now, Rwanda has an asylum processing capacity of about 400 people a year. You want to start shouting and forcing the courts to take on a judgment on one side to say that actually the skies are the colour of purple now on the basis that we don't like what the courts have done. That you get yourself into that kind of fight over a policy that <coughs> doesn't exist. That is a party that is just eating itself alive. And I think for once... It's very, very rare that Labour gets to sit back and feel unified and just watch the spectacle of Harakiri on the other side, but we're in one of those moments. Anita? Well, I do want to slightly go back to this question about the evil plotters and now the... Um, by the, by the way, are you an evil plotter? Are no. you in this WhatsApp group? Chat? No, I'm, I'm neither a plotter nor evil. I'm sort of virtuous and, and convivial. You see, you are regarded, I think, among some Conservatives as a bit of a dark figure. Aren't you? Really? Oh, you're, oh, you're making you, me sound too... You, 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 you know that. That makes me feel alluring and uh, excited. Really? And slightly <laughs> exotic. You're, you're painting me in a particular way. No, look, I, I, the way I see it is this. Look, I, I'm sorry I interrupted no, no, you. go but, for it. But political parties always had internal debate. And that debate should be about policy, not about people. So it should be about direction. It should be about particular focus. In my view, it should be about philosophy. That's a really important part. Have you read Nadine Doris's book? <laughs> I, I haven't actually. I've seen it serialised in the mail. You should. But, um, but I've seen it serialised in the mail. So, so that's not a bad thing. That's a healthy thing. Where it becomes personal, where it becomes vindictive, of course, that's unhealthy. But having proper debate about, I mean, the common sense group, you mentioned it. We've had really good engagement, a serious piece of legislation. We've had ministers. I've got a minister coming to meet the group tomorrow, talk about uh, what she's doing in her department. She's asked to meet us. We've had that engagement since but before. But there's so many of these groups okay. now that ministers spend their entire time trying to pacify them, and that can't be healthy. They should be getting on, on with their jobs. Well, I, no. That, look, I was a minister, and I had proper engagement with people from across the House. What my view, my, my instructor my civil servants, any MP that wants to come to see me, come to see me, whether it be Labour or Tory or Liberal. And that engagement... Not bang is the a, table because Sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm just emphasising the yeah. point. Um, but that, that's a proper part of being a minister, that okay. engagement. Anita, we interrupted you. Oh, I interrupted you. No, not at all. What I was going to say was just, I'm sticking up for the evil plotters group because how many of us are members of random groups with random titles that are often half a joke, right? So I, I think there is something about, and, and I mean this quite seriously, that I was a special advisor during the May years and there was a lot of... And it did feel... You've quite, done well to recover. Yeah, well, it did <laughs> feel quite Westminster bobbly, I hesitate to say, the way that we all sort of ran around being like, this is the most dramatic thing this has ev that's ever happened. And I'm not convinced that the public or our politics or even media really benefited hugely from that. And I do caution against us being in this moment where we talk about, you know, this is, there are ferocious wars raging in the Conservative Party. Are yes. there? I think there is a degree of hyperbole in that. And I, I genuinely think that obscures important political discussion and distracts us when we get obsessed with the personalities and less with the policy issues, which, of which I think there are some significant ones. Um, on the question of the groups, though, there's where I think that they are, again, a bit of a distraction. I think there are, it is really important, and it's become increasingly important that MPs are becoming more independent-minded, more conscientious about their constituencies and other issues where they feel they have an identity and need to stand up for what they believe in. And continue ministerial and, and number 10 engagement and that is so 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 critical and I think this matters for all political parties and I actually also don't think every debate is a bad one. I think political parties should have debate and I actually don't think this old Adam about axiom about how divided parties never prosper actually is the right one. I think if you have the right kind of argument in your party it can define you as a party but 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 
I think at the moment there is a danger that we are so mired in the personality that any of the things, good or bad, the government is doing is not actually getting the amount of attention it should. Unless you want to come in. Yeah, I wanted to take issue with this idea that somehow the kind of chaos that we're seeing now is a natural behaviour for any political party. We've now, we're, we're into the 14th year of Conservative-led governments. So we obviously had 13 years of Labour government before then. Now, of course, you know, people read the biographies, there were different personalities, there were discussions, there were indeed arguments discussions. around policy. Blair but can and Brown? I, but can I just say, when it comes to Gordon Brown, you know, that speech when he set out what those governments had achieved, what's going to be in the Conservative one? What's in the Conservative variant of that? You know, Gordon Brown listing all of those different changes made by his government. You know, everything from peace in Northern Ireland, sure start, record satisfaction in the NHS, you know, I could go on. What's in the Conservative one? That, that's the difference. That yes, there of course is debate within the Labour Party. Okay. But this well, well, chaos let's, currently let's, sapping any engagement. Let's test this out. Three big achievements of the last 14 years to go in the next Conservative manifesto, John. I think, I think coping with COVID um, uh, was incredible. And uh, any government would have found that incredibly challenging. It didn't all go right. But, but some of it did. The vaccination program is something I think we can be legitimately proud of. I wasn't a minister at the time, and a lot of ministers said to me, you're very lucky you're not, John, because we're having to deal with a dynamic situation to make decisions in the moment uh, on the basis of information which is which is uh, changing very rapidly. So that was a really big thing. Okay, so that's one. Ukraine, I think the way we responded to Ukraine uh, and brought the country together and the House together, by the way, and I give credit to people across the House for that, there was real unity and, again, something that no government would have anticipated and no government would have welcomed, leaving aside the, the fact that clearly the people of Ukraine wouldn't have welcomed it. I think the way we dealt with that, the way we responded, the way we led Europe, actually. And then, finally, getting Brexit done when people thought it wouldn't be done. You know, don't forget, if you take a step back, it's easy to forget that uh, when uh, we were going through that very torturous process, you were an advisor at the time, uh, many people thought this would be lost. I mean, the Liberal Democrats were trying to get another referendum. Uh, Labour were all over the place. Um, and actually, we got that done. That's three, okay. off the top of my head. Well, well done for that, because one of your colleagues didn't fare quite so well with a similar question on this programme uh, no. last week. Couldn't name a single public service that got better in the last 14 years. Uh, right, we will move on to a really interesting subject next from Martin in Doncaster, but first of all, we'll take a break. It's 8.46. This is LBC.
A48. Annalise Dodds, Sir John Hayes, Anita Boateng and Ian Dunn with us answering your questions. Uh, let's go to Martin in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Hello, Ian and panel. Yes. With the Tory mortgage cost of living crisis, why should the public feel sorry for George Freeman? Hmm. Now, George Freeman was a minister um, in the business department, wasn't he, I think? Um, He has said he quit his ministerial role back in November because he couldn't afford to pay his mortgage on his salary of £118,300. He said his mortgage went up from £800 to £2,000 a month. Now, Downing Street says it has no plans to change their approach to ministerial pay. Um, I suppose this is evidence, Annalise, that the, the cost of living crisis has hit the Tories too? <laughs> well, I think for many people listening to this, actually already that salary is an eye-watering amount, I think probably to most people listening to this. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt, but that as the questioner himself said, there is a mortgage crisis that's hitting our country. It's been made worse by the decisions of the Trust government, of course, that whacked on a couple of extra hundred pounds to many people's mortgage. And of course, also by the fact that we've seen house building cratering under current government as well, because their decisions on target. So it has been made worse than it needed to be by the Conservatives. But I have to say, you know, if I'm thinking about who I've got sympathy with, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be going, uh, first of all, in my thoughts to those who are earning that huge amount. I'd be thinking about average earners who are really, really struggling. It never really works when a politician plays the poverty card, does it? Well, because we're not poor uh, and we're not struggling financially in the way that so many people are. And, you know, ultimately, there'll be people listening to this who are not able to plan a family holiday this year, who are not able to be doing things they used to do, like, you know, having the odd dinner out or something like that, who can't buy the kids, uh, you know, the different outfits they want, this kind of thing, because they don't have the money. And I think that really is what we should be focused on, delivering the growth for our country so that we can have an improvement in living standards rather than seeing the slide that we've seen particularly over recent years. Now, John, I I don't know what kind of lifestyle you lead, but Mm. um, did you find it difficult to cope with the ministerial salary? Um, I'm, you cut your cut your cloth according to your your needs and your income, don't you? And uh, I don't know what George's personal life's like. I don't know what sort of house he lives in. I don't know how he spends his money. And it wouldn't be for me to comment on any of that. But what I do wonder about, to make a serious point, is uh, whether we ought to have this set independently. And we took a decision as MPs collectively that we would uh, have our salaries no longer decided upon by Parliament, no longer voted on by MPs. It was always very difficult. And from many years ago now, we uh, established the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority and they have sole responsibility uh, to fix MP salaries. So who sets ministerial salaries? Well, that's you see, that's the problem. Ministerial salaries are set by the government and they were frozen. When I became a minister, um, in 2010, ministerial salaries were frozen at the 2009 level. And we all had to write a letter saying we're prepared to accept that. We were kind of, it was obligatory. <laughs> you wrote a letter saying, I'm prepared to have my salary frozen. And they've been frozen ever since, I think. I think they've probably been frozen since 2009, as far as I know. Now, um, and I'll argue whether it's right or wrong, but what I'm saying is perhaps it shouldn't be a, a matter decided on by politicians. It should be a matter decided independently. And I think that's a very good way of proceeding. So I hadn't thought of it until uh, now, really, uh, as I'm not a minister and not likely to be one, I don't think. Uh, but now, you've said that way... twice now, which indicates that you might quite like to be one. <laughs> well, do you think I should Because be... you have had a few comebacks, haven't you? Uh, well, I've, I've been a minister in a lot of government departments, <laughs> but since you've said how alluring I am, I think my prospects... Did I say of, that? I, well, you, I, I didn't imply. It was I think implied. that's a maybe gross I interpretation. It. <laughs> OK, so maybe my, my, my share price is going up, but who knows? Well, that's what happens when you appear on this program. Who knows? Anita. Who knows? Um, so I, I wanted to sort of, I thought that George was probably making the point about the unaffordability of mortgages, but having looked at what he actually said, it feels like he was trying to make the point about politics not necessarily bringing in the talent that you need, and he talked about um, it being a danger that only hedge fund donors and failed trade unionists and spin doctors can do now. Um, and I always feel... Well, which of those are you, Annalise? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not any of those. It's quite a, a random collection of people Maybe that he's mentioned. Maybe he was just talking about Tories. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure about the failed trade unions, but, but, but there we are. 
I, I always think it's important that we have a conversation about the structures of our politics, including the pay of our politics, not thinking about whether or not we like politicians, because we've all seen the polling, but who we want in our politics and whether it would structurally improve and make more accessible our politics. So I, I don't think George should have used himself as an example, but I do think politics would be healthier if we didn't start from the position of thinking everyone in politics is probably the worst person we've ever met, that everyone is out for the take, that everyone's being dishonest. And we actually had a conversation about how to get the very best politicians in and the most out of our politics. So I think that I'm trying to find a kind of useful and interesting point in a story where we can say to George, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't know if he was going for sympathy, but I don't think we're necessarily um, bringing out the, the orchestra. I, I thought he was sacked. I didn't, I mean, he said he, said he left the government of his own volition. Mm. I don't, Ooh, I don't have know the clue. Truth. We, I, can't, I don't we have... can't know that. We can't know that. But he was very committed to science and innovation. So, um, so. Oh, he was very committed to supporting Penny Mordaunt for leader until he defected to Rishi Sunak. Well, I forgot that. Ian. So <laughs> when people make this point that politicians should be paid more, MPs or ministers, you know, quite a lot more. I've never really signed up to that. And I think th that that moment with him is a pretty good indication of why. So that you want politicians to feel the jeopardy. You don't want them paid so much that they can just put their kids in private school and live in a gated community and use private health care all of the time. You want them to be affected. Now, suddenly, if you're paying 2000 on a mortgage every month, you're affected even, and to be fair to him, even when you're making actually like a pretty decent salary, even if you're making 100 grand, that does still hurt. There's actually quite a lot of people in this country making 100 grand, getting hurt by paying that much. When you factor in the other things you need to pay for in your life, especially if there's only one of you earning. So on that basis, I kind of think that this is a really good parable for why MPs really are actually, and ministers as well, on about the right level. And that noise is that you occasionally hear, you hear it much more in private in Westminster than you do in public, of like, well, we really have to pay them more. It's almost a truism, I think is completely false. And here's a pretty good demonstration of why. Yeah, but hang on. But, 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 you've got to look at international comparisons. So, so I guess what Ipsa do when they fix min, uh, MPs pay is one of the things they look at is what people are paid in other parallel democracies. And actually, when they last reviewed MPs' pay, I think that's exactly, they did some, uh, quite a big survey and found that uh, British MPs weren't paid more than most of their, uh, their, their compatriots. They paid less. So I think there needs to be, all I want is independence in this. I don't, I don't want to have a say in my salary. I want someone to independently gauge it to measure it properly uh, and to make uh, to make a decision on it. Okay. I, don't, I don't want to vote on that. Quickly, Anne <laughs> Yes, very briefly, one issue that we've not talked about in this is severance pay for ministers. And actually, I think a lot of people would be quite shocked. Yeah, a lot that, of that recently, Well, isn't there? exactly, mm. almost a million pound actually has been mm. paid out in severance pay. And, you know, we think the time is most definitely come to be reforming that. You know, it well, really I wonder is. whether you'll do it when you are a minister. Well, we set out those plans to do it. We're determined to do it because, you know, at the moment, for example, if you then are re-employed as a minister, there's no mechanism to claw that back. If you're found to have engaged in, you know, misdemeanours again, you know, you get the same severance pay. So, you know, there really is a strong okay. public interest in reform. Peter Mandelson was in and out. He kept getting paid and repaid. Steady. Um, right. Final, this is a text question from <laughs> Kevin, but I'm going to ask you, you can't answer this question really in 30 seconds each. Stop it. Um, but you going to have to try. Uh, should Rishi Sunak get a bit of credit for finally restoring power sharing in Northern Ireland? Anita. Yes, but I don't think it's just Rishi Sunak. I genuinely think there's been um, a, a concerted effort across the Northern Ireland office. Chris Heaton Harris has been deeply involved. But I think the Windsor framework was one step along and it looks as though the package that comes out is going to move that further. I'm really optimistic. I think this is a really positive step for Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Annalise? Well, the people of Northern Ireland have been without a government for two years, so of course the fact that we finally, hopefully, will be seeing power sharing again is incredibly important, but we need to see now support so that, that can get going and so that those really big issues in Northern Ireland, everything from civil servants' pay through to public service, the desperate state of the NHS can actually be got a grip on. Ian? Uh, if we get power sharing back in Northern Ireland without any caveat or hesitation, it'll be a good thing that has been done by Rishi Sunak. However, <laughs> let's, well, let's, just, let's just take it for a moment, because there are lots of competing... If you think about what the EU requires, what Tory Brexiters, hardline Brexiters require, and what the DUP requires, in terms of an arrangement, finding something that satisfies those three groups 
is not really possible when you think about alignment. So the next few days and the next few weeks will be very, very interesting indeed. John Hayes. Brilliant's right. It's always been about trying to balance the interests of various different groups. But I think the straight answer to your question is, Rishi said it does deserve some credit, but not alone. All those people who are trying to make this work deserve credit. We've got to look at the detail. The devil's in the detail. You're absolutely right. But we've got to get back to a situation where where power sharing works in Northern Ireland for the benefit of Northern Ireland. But all credit to the government for trying to do so. Well, when you've got a situation where the British Prime Minister, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the leader of Sinn Féin and the leader of the DUP all agree, you'd like to think that other groups... I'm looking at you, John Hayes, here, mm. might not cause a bit of trouble. Yeah, I mean, I do think that the DUP are critical in this. I've always taken the view that it's not for us to second guess their perspective on it. You yeah. know, I'm a unionist, you know, of course I'm a unionist. Um, and if they've come to the conclusion it's right, it'd be pretty perverse for us to say it was wrong. Well said. Right, our fun question from Millie in Stirling. The biggest fire festival in Europe up Helly R I hope I pronounced that right is underway in Shetland celebrating Norse heritage please could your panel tell me the best festival they've ever attended uh, Alice well we have the fireballs where I'm from which Pardon? is Stonehaven F fireballs oh it's a furballs yeah no 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 it's, it's a very big thing but uh, I actually used to steward music festivals a Did bit you? When, when I was in mm. my youth uh, and although I was stewarding it, um, I think uh, Creamfields was was a pretty good festival. So I, I really liked dance music, and it was an amazing, well, amazing what, experience. What's the fa most famous act you met? <sighs> oh well, I mean, I have I have actually been backstage. Sorry, I'm bragging now. I have actually been backstage at some music festivals, and I've met uh, I met Oasis, I met Asian Dub Foundation. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have remembered me because I was just the person trying to stop the kind of thousands of groupies I was going to say, trying to get into the area. Good luck stewarding Oasis. <laughs> uh, John Hayes. I say any festival I'm at on fire, so, you know, you know that, you know that, I am. But I think I picked two. So in the 1970s, mid-1970s, when I was a, a teenager, there was two great festivals at, at the Valley, Charlton Athletics Ground. And you look it up, the Who were there, Lou Reed was there, some really big acts. And as a, as a boy... Uh, going down, I come from South East London, as you know, going down to Charlton for those two years running was a big thing. And more recently, my two sons, my wife and I went to Roxy Music's final uh, tour concert at the O2. And I'm a huge Roxy Music fan, huge Brian Ferry fan. And so that was really special. So something from my teenage years, okay. to my recent years. Ian. I mean, look, it's going to be uh, Glastonbury 2017. But I'd just like to point out, I did not actually enjoy it because festivals are awful. Like, I hate <laughs> tents. I hate yeah. waking up in a tent at 3am and thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? And where do I go to the loo now? I hate all the people. I hate smelling after three days. I mean, basically, everything about the festival experience is completely appalling. And anyone that claims to like it has clearly gone completely insane. As you can imagine, I was at a lot of fun at Glastonbury. People were really I happy to be around side, though, which is why I've never been and never will. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to be with Ian, unfortunately. I like to shower. I just love it. And so <laughs> I've never gone to Glastonbury. And I would love to go if someone was to spot me a massive glamping I don't know what like the instant inbuilt shower thing I will go um so I've been to I pick Afro Nation which is a kind of big Ghanaian kind of festival but it's a one day thing everyone is clean and everyone leaves um so that's my <laughs> kind of festival I'm going to say the Appledore Literary Festival <laughs> <laughs> and on that controversial note, let me thank our panel, Annalise Dodds, Sir John Hayes, Anita Boateng and Ian Dunt. Uh, tomorrow's panel includes LBC presenter and host of the Difficult Women podcast, Rachel Johnson. Have you been on that, Annalise? No. I think you should go on it. I'd love to. I'd love to hear a conversation between you and Rachel. Uh, the broadcaster and author Michael Crick, Labour MP Barry Gardner and a government minister as yet unnamed, which is not unusual. Uh, coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking about whether a two-state solution is still viable, and particularly after David Cameron's comments today, when he has hinted that the British government may well soon recognise Palestine as a state. Now, some people think, well, what's the point of that? You, you recognise a state after it's been created, not before it's been created. How can you recognise something that doesn't exist? But do you think that that is an important moment in British foreign policy, and do you think he's right? Right, 0345 6060 973. That's the number to call here on LBC.
on your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. 